Today's horror story is written by Throra 2038. The blow statement is entirely factual. All incidents and people involved are factual. These are the final words of Harrison Oliband. I keep asking myself, how much information do I really need to share with you? I worry if I go too far back, I'll use up my word count on my childhood. But if I don't give you details, will you understand my motive? No, I don't think even I understand my motive. I was a rebellious child, leaning towards spiteful. I frequently spent the nights in the cold fields of our neighbors while my parents were strung out. At the time, I managed to convince myself that I didn't mind, and looking back at it now, I can't tell if I genuinely didn't mind. Some nights I'd wander the streets and look up at the stars. I liked the stars. I like to imagine we're reborn as stars, peaceful and safe. I met my ex-wife, Sarah, on one of these nights when we were 15, and I was convinced it was love at first sight. I know now it was infatuation. She overlooked the fact that I was mostly homeless and would let me sneak into her bedroom at night, where we'd spend most of the night just talking. A year into our relationship, she got pregnant, and I knew I'd have to get serious to support the both of us. I started working at the local dock, and supporting my family was the only thing that got me through the day. Have you heard the song Rhiannon by Fleetwood Mac? It was my favorite song. I listened to it on repeat when things were good and new with Sarah. We welcomed Rhiannon Grace Oliband into the world on June 20th, 1980. She was literal perfection, and I knew I'd do anything to keep my baby safe. Sarah wanted to be a stay-at-home parent, so to afford our home and our living expenses, I started working on the dock almost seven days a week. It was during one of my trips where I saw it. Sitting on a rock completely illuminated by the moon alone. I stand tall at 6'5", but I know had this thing stood it would have dwarfed me in comparison. The sea around it boiled and writhed angrily in the dark void. It was a mixture of a reptilian creature and an octopus with tentacles that reached toward nothing in particular and scales that opened and closed to greedily suck in the air. Its mouth stood agape, and I couldn't have opened my mouth as wide as that, even if you broke my jaw. Sharp rows of teeth lined the inside and outside of its maw. I recall thinking it could have eaten me whole had it decided. Its eyes, an ironic shade of blue, stared into mine, let me know that I was its prey. Its eyes were the same shade as Rhiannon's. I wish I could say I did the masculine thing and went hunting for it, but instead I fainted. When I woke, I was told I collapsed due to the stress of working seven days a week and should reduce my work hours. But one look at my daughter's eyes, I knew I couldn't. I needed to give her everything I could. I didn't have the privilege to quit my job. I saw that creature again several times and eventually started to feel a pull to go toward it, to let myself jump overboard and just swim however many miles away it was. I'm not a strong swimmer. I would have drowned, and I feel like it knew that. It was undoubtedly sadistic. It would whisper in my head languages I didn't understand, but somehow understood. They were violent and threatening. I was crossing into its territory, its voice was raspy and still haunts me to this day. I spent weeks looking this creature up and found almost nothing. I would have been convinced it was fake had it not been for the incident. Two months after the first sighting, I started hearing it when I was home. Started seeing it in my garden and I understood it was hungry. 
At first I tried packaged meat, but it grew increasingly aggressive. I'm not proud of my actions, but I let my dog outside. I still remember the screaming that night. But you have to understand that I thought I was protecting my daughter. Perhaps I shouldn't have fed it because it kept coming back and back. I only had so much money to keep it fed. I fed it rabbits, cats, and whatever I could find. Thankfully, eventually becoming numb to the screaming. The rabbits were the worst, though. And I almost considered not getting them, but... They're the easiest, you see. Then it started showing up in my daughter's dreams. She no longer slept and would cry until she vomited all over herself and me. I was being investigated for child abuse because she'd come to her school crying and wetting herself. The creature had burnt its image behind our eyelids until it was all we could see and think about. And then the incident of June 21st happened. Rannon had brought home two friends, Skylar and Winter, to celebrate her birthday. The creature hadn't bothered us for a week, so I had assumed it had left us alone, but I was so wrong, and it cost me my sanity and my conscience. I awoke at 3.40 a.m. to a pounding headache, the screams of the slaughtered ringing mockingly in my head, and I knew who had placed them there. The creature could be particularly cruel when hungry. I released four rabbits and a cat that night, but it wasn't enough. It's hungry and unsatisfied screams ringing in my ears, driving me slowly insane. I stuffed my bleeding ears with cotton wool and huddled up against the wall for an hour wondering why it hadn't woken the girls. It wanted them sleeping. I knew what it wanted, but I refused. I tried playing music to block it out, but my radio wouldn't work. I crept into my daughter's bedroom that was only illuminated by moonlight and picked the girl up. I know you won't believe me, but I sobbed the entire way down, questioning my actions, but I had to do it for my daughter. I almost didn't do it. Placing the girl on the sofa, I almost backed out of it. Then I saw it, pressed tightly up against the window, with its hot breath fogging up the glass and drool making a puddle outside, gray skin stretched too tightly over its body. It mouthed words to me I couldn't understand. I don't want to understand. I picked the girl up, not thinking of my movements, and before I could even exit the door, before I could even take her back inside and tell her it was all a bad dream, The creature's tentacles snatched her roughly, so roughly that clumps of her hair and scalp stuck to my fingers as I tried to hold on to her. I wish it kept her asleep, that I wouldn't have to see the fear or betrayal in her eyes. I wouldn't have heard her screams or the crunch of her bones, the moist sound of it tearing through muscle. The creature held my eye contact the entire time. I don't know how the neighborhood didn't wake up. I called the girl's parents in the morning and told them she'd run away in the middle of the night. They didn't believe me, but had no evidence of foul play. I didn't see the creature for another few weeks. Its hunger finally sated, but I can hear it in my head again. I don't think I can cope with another sacrifice. I can't sacrifice myself both out of cowardice and needing to look after my daughter. You should invite Skylar around again. I smiled tightly at my daughter. I hope this one will keep it satisfied for more than two weeks. She is plumper than the other girl. Police found this document inside the home of Harrison, Harry Alaband. Both Harrison and Rhiannon are currently missing. Both are assumed deceased. The skeletal remains of two girls, currently unidentified, as well as Mrs. Sarah Alaband, were found in the living room. Cause of death is currently unconfirmed. 
Mr. Alabama was under the care of psychiatrist Dr. Jones throughout the year of 1990. The house has been found to be abandoned since 1995. It's currently unknown who kept up the payments on the home. Thank you for listening. You can probably handle another horror story, right?